know, you you see that things that we consider to be so fundamental to economics turn out to be actually a lot more complicated than we initially think because we automatically assume certain things about um, about the fundamental concepts that we're using. We think that we have gone to the bottom of it and understood them very clearly. But in fact, if I question you, if I ask you about if I do a series of Socratic questions, very soon you discover that actually you don't really know quite a bit. You kind of just assume that if I give the answer supply and demand or market forces or utility or cost of production or something of that sort, it will sort settle the ma matter. But um, that's not necessarily the case is what I want to tell you. So here's a question. How many rotis will buy one laptop. Sorry? I mean, for example, you guys were talking about uh, utility functions and consumer behavior. But there's no person that I'm talking about here. I'm just talking about rotis and computers. There's no one person I'm talking about here. So how will, how will you, this is such a different thing. It's, it's an organic substance. It grows out of the ground. It um, is something that we consume, we eat. It's not just a want, it's a need, let's say, okay? Uh, maybe Tristan is like, no, it's just a want for me. Uh, it's not a need, but for Pakistanis, certainly this would be a fundamental thing. We all, you know, are wheat eaters, basically. Um, where is a laptop is an inorganic substance. It's made out of silicon and, you know, uh, plastics and uh, metals and other things, etc. And uh, it has nothing in common with this. We, we can't eat a laptop. We don't necessarily absolutely need a laptop. We can live without it. I know that may have come as a bit of a surprise to some of you. But yes, you can live without computers and social media, etc. People did. I did. I grew up without them. So how do we settle a question such as this? How many rotis will buy one computer? It's kind of difficult to think about it if you let go of the jargon for just a bit. And if you had to explain it to some ordinary person who had not studied economics, some guy who sells rotis on the street, he asked you, Pau, how many rotis will it take to, you know, uh, how is the relationship of rotis and computers determined? You might find it difficult to answer that question in, a, in simple language without using all the terms that you've learned uh, in school, etc., thinking that you answered the question, which as I think, I hope I've shown you, themselves beg many questions in turn. So one answer that's been provided by economics, mainstream economics, is scarcity. And some of you spoke about this. Uh, uh, if you look at any economics textbook, and I have taken this out of the most popular economics textbook in the world, which is called Principles of Economics. Um, it's the fundamental textbook that's used as introduction to economics in uh, American universities and all over the world. Okay? So, um, so it begins by saying okay, scarcity is a fundamental economic problem because there's a, a, a gap between limited resources and theoretically limitless wants. But uh, so what this creates is opportunity cost, is a trade-off. The cost of something or its value is what you give up to get it. But how would you measure what you give up? Would it be in terms of utility? Would it be in terms of labor? How would I be able to calculate what it means to me to give up spending an evening with my children and my family, how would you evaluate that? What value would you put on that? How could you put a value on that even? It's a difficult question. So what does opportunity cost mean? Well, for a business, it seems clear that there are decisions to be made, there are alternatives, and every alternative for a businessman has an opportunity cost. If I invest here, if I go for stocks, or if I go for bonds, how much do I win, how much do I lose? And for a consumer, you can have a burger or you can have a pizza. You're always thinking, what do I want more? What do I want less? That's how economics teaches us. But if you think about it a little more deeply, it, this has not really answered the question. Because the question really was, um, how would we evaluate this cost? How do we, what, in what terms do we, do we understand costs? That's the central question. So economics uses a lot of this stuff. These are Cartesian coordinates, a two-dimensional grid, basically, just may but it's sada si baat hai ki ye x axis hai ye y axis hai you put the independent variable on one axis and the dependent variable on the other axis and you can you can calculate the slope of a gradient etc by using this simple formula 
And if you don't have a straight line, but you have a curved line, then you can use calculus and that gives a high level of sophistication, etc. The formula still pretty much remains the same. It's always going to be dy over dx. But nonetheless, that's how you do it. And this is this method, uh, this calculation has become kind of the methodology of nearly all economic questions. Optimization, maximization, whether it's utility or resources or whatever. That's why when you study economics, you first have to really understand calculus. If you don't get calculus, then you can't get economics as a whole. So you can. All right, so then we come to the idea of marginal benefits and costs. And we are told that uh, marginal benefits decline. Anybody, can anyone tell me why do, what are marginal benefits and why do they decline? Yes? Increase or decrease? Yeah. So marginal means the next unit and the next unit and the next unit, the last unit. And the idea is that every time you have something, the next time you just took a sip of water. So that sip of water gives you greater utility than the next sip of water, which will give you slightly less utility and less utility and less utility. Is that true? Is that really true? I know economics may that's taken as true. But is that really true? Yes? So you can have positive marginal benefits as well. Yeah. yeah, or you can have them going up and down. I mean, I often think about it this way, okay, water is a discontinuous kind of substance. So how do I even measure one unit of water? There's no way to measure one unit of water. Will it be one gulp of water? Will it be one glass of water? Will it be one millimeter of water? That's completely not clear to me. And also what you notice is if I, if I look at a single day, or a single sitting or an hour, then yes, of course, every sip of water that you have will give you less utility. But if I look at a one month, your consumption almost evens out. Even the number of calories you take over a month will even out. You're just gonna to have to take 2,000 to 2,500 calories, et cetera, or maybe 1,500 to 2,500 calories. If you take 4,000, 5,000 calories, you'll be dead in a, unless you really work out and you burn them off, correct? So in a certain sense, what you get in a slightly longer term is a very even uh, curve for marginal benefits. They don't decline, they don't incline, they just go flat. Um, something to think about. But if you have too much of it in the short term, yeah, it'll decline. So it's not very clear that this is the case all the time, but it is certainly seems to be the case some of the time. So nonetheless, economics may, we take this as a given, okay, marginal benefits are declining, whereas marginal cost remains the same. That's just basically kind of like saying that an individual when you buy something, you can't determine the price, so you have always have to buy it at the same price. So every a bottle of Aquafina that I buy, I'm going to pay the same price for it, even though I enjoy it less and less. So what is the point at which I will have the maximization of uh, costs versus benefits? It will be when my marginal cost is equal to my marginal benefit. You can also look at benefit as revenue, etc. This point is the optimization point. So you see the line may be osakti, they can also be curved lines, etc. But that's the idea. This becomes fundamental to understanding economics. Very simple stuff, nothing complicated. We're starting with the easy peasy stuff and then you'll see we get more and more complicated. What is an externality? An externality is the impact of one person's actions on the well-being of a bystander. So here you have a situation where you have marginal social costs and marginal private costs and the two are not the same thing. A marginal social cost may be very different from a private cost. So private cost may be that I may like to go uh, come to uh, university on my big SUV. Let's say I have a Pajero and I love to drive it and I come, you know, screeching, etc. The private cost to me will be the fuel that I pay. But there is an added cost, which is the pollution I've, I've caused while I, while I came here. And that is the true social <coughs> cost. But the price that I pay will be determined by the marginal benefit I get versus the marginal private cost I pay. But the public will be paying an extra cost for it, which brings my marginal social cost up here. So in other words, the price mechanism will price this thing at this point and this quantity. Whereas, in fact, if I look at it from the point of view of society, it should be up here. The price should be a lot higher and the quantity should be a lot less. 
So this has huge implications for environmentalism because the market, in fact, always misallocates resources. It's not true that the market um, allocates resources efficiently. It misallocates resources all the time because the market never calculates for social costs. It always and only calculates for private costs and private benefits. Never social costs and social benefits. So, Pella to Spanner in the works of economics Right after we discussed this optimization point, we discover that this is a private thing, this is a private thing. But if you look at it from the social point of view, the market misallocates resources entirely. It misses the point where for society as a whole, price is optimized. It's not a small thing because right now uh, we are, as many environmentalists will tell you, we are facing a problem of global warming. And uh, some people think that the floods that we experienced just this last year, which inundated a third of Pakistan and cost us something like $30 billion in damages. Uh, many people believe that th those, that is the consequence of uh, global warming. If that is true, then that obviously means that uh, we are not able, the market is not able to understand the cost that society or humanity is paying. And some people are even more alarmist about it. They say that the world is coming to an end because of the amount of carbon that we are emitting into the atmosphere. And that the market mechanism uh, is incapable, entirely incapable, of allocating resources in such a way as to save the planet. That's a huge, huge criticism, not a minor thing. The market always responds to incentives. People respond to material incentives. We are told this again and again. In fact, our pura educational model is built around this idea that if I give you the incentive of a grade, you will study, and if I don't give you the incentive of a grade, you won't study. It's a very neoliberal model. Well, along, along comes Samuel Bowles, and in this uh, work, The Moral Economy, uh, why good incentives are no substitute for good citizens. He makes the argument, in fact, that incentives don't always work. And in fact, sometimes incentives achieve the very opposite result of what you want them to achieve. So incentives may crowd out what he calls ethical and generous motives and thus backfire. If you have an ethical and a generous motive for doing something, and then you're offered an incentive on it, uh, you might in fact feel that there is no ethical reason for you to do that work, and you might decide not to do it. I gave you an example that if I, you know, like just throw a banana peel, etc., and if I'm told that's bad behavior, I might stop doing it because I think it's bad behavior. But if I'm given an incentive and I'm told, well, you can pay for your bad behavior, then in fact, I might start to do more of that bad behavior than I would have if I was just told not to do it. People's motivations are more complex than, sadly, mainstream economics accepts. Uh, people have a variety of motivations. To give you an example, if utility functions are all that matters, how do you explain people who want to go and blow themselves up and commit suicide for a cause, let's say? How do you explain that? It would be very difficult for us to understand and explain uh, what we would consider a behavior that seems to directly contradict your own well-being, uh, any benefit to yourself. You would really have to stretch the idea of utility in order to be able to do that. And you have to stretch it so far that it wouldn't make sense. So for example, you'd have to stretch it so far that basically you'd end up putting selfish and selfless behavior in the same category. Let's say I give you 100 rupees and I give you 100 rupees. And then you decide, well, the person on the street really needed those 100 rupees and you give the, that money away. Well, we would call that selfless behavior, correct? And you decide, okay, no, no, I'm going to take that 100 rupees and I'm going to get myself a Boston cream donut with it, right? And generally speaking, I'm not that we're against Boston cream donuts or whatever, but generally consider, we would consider that you did something that would be to your own benefit. Whereas you did something that was not to your benefit, but you gave it away. But how would you explain it through a utility function? You'd say, well, you got utility from Boston cream and you got utility from the other thing, from giving the money away. The problem with that idea is that in that definition, please note that there is no such thing now as a selfless activity. Sure. Did you get what I said? I'll repeat it again. In fact, what you've done is, through a very clever sleight of hand, you've eliminated the possibility altogether of the divergence between selfless and selfish activity. So all activities have become selfish, 
even self, even what we would ordinarily consider to be selfless activities have become selfish activities because you do selfless activities because you feel good about them and you do selfish activities because you feel good about them. And so there's no distinction anymore. And since there's no distinction anymore, now you can easily say that all of it is utility functions. It doesn't make any sense. The other major problem with utility, of course, is there's no way to measure it. How do I know that, uh, you know, there, there is no way that I can put a probe on your brain and say, you derive this much utility from, you know, your actions because your dopamine levels and other levels will not tell you. There's no such thing as a util in your mind. There's no way to measure it at all whatsoever. So you could be a very expressive person and say, oh, I really want and I need this. Or you could be a relatively a person that doesn't express yourself that much and you say, well, I would like if I could have this. Does that mean that they're at the same, that there's a difference? No, we don't know. Because it's such a subjective thing that there's no objective measurement of it at all. There's no way to know it. The only way to know it, say economists tell us, is by what they call revealed preference. Revealed preference means that if I prefer this over this, then I've revealed my preference to you by actually buying that thing. That becomes a circular argument. So there's no way that I can predict what of these two things, what choices I will make. I can only say that the choices I made are the choices I made because I made those choices which has not explained anything if you notice. So utility becomes therefore a circular explanation. And that's why many economists in fact also reject it. Next up, we look at trade. In trade, we have the argument of comparative advantage, which we Ricardo from Ricardo. And we are told that trade you know, allows each person to specialize or each country to specialize in the activities he or she does best. So if I'm a good teacher, that's what I should do and I can earn more money from that and then I can buy the things that I want and if you are a good shoemaker perhaps then you should make those shoes and uh, both of us can trade and in that way we will be better off than we were if we did not specialize. And of course as you know Adam Smith gave a very strong reason for why specialization really does work. In terms of boosting production there's no doubt that specialization boosts production. But the problem with comparative advantage also is that you can have a country whose sole comparative advantage is in a crop which has no positive technological externalities. Say for example that you're going to grow cotton for the rest of your life. Or you could have your comparative advantage in just creating people who will then move abroad and work over there as is sadly the case with Pakistan. Right? 800,000 people go from Pakistan to, to work abroad and they earn about as the same amount that we earn from all our exports. They earn 30 billion dollars in terms of remittances and that's just the legal amount that we know of. They probably earn a lot more than that. So your comparative advantage could be in something that locks a particular region of the world or a country into a state of permanent underdevelopment. Your comparative advantage, for example, could be for a sub-Saharan country, like uh, is to just buy carbon credits for the countries that do all the polluting. Or it could be that you just take the depleted uranium and the other uh, radioactive substances and bury them in, in your soil. How is that beneficial to your country? I'm not sure. Uh, how is that going to create a situation in which sub-Saharan people are going to have the same, uh, you know, uh, quality of life that people in other parts of the world are enjoying? I'm not sure that that is ever going to happen in that given model of development. So markets, of course, are very central to our understanding and Adam Smith had the idea of the invisible hand. Uh, the market economy is an economy that allocates resources through the through three centralized decisions of many firms and households as they interact in markets for goods and services. This is taken from a classic economics textbook. And you can also have a market failure. All economists accept that market failures occur, which is a situation in which a market left on its own fails to allocate, it, allocate resources efficiently. I've already shown you that, in fact, this will always be the case uh, from the social point of view, not necessarily from the private point of view. Now, but the other critique is that markets, in markets, everyone wo votes with their wallets. You don't, not everybody has an equal voice in the market. If I have more money, I have more votes in the market. If I have less money, then I, if I have no money, then do I determine what goods and services get produced? Absolutely not. I have nothing to say in that whatsoever. So, and last but not least, ma least markets can be highly unstable. Right now, the International Monetary Fund has told Pakistan that the State Bank of Pakistan has to follow the market exchange rate of the dollar by in a, in a gap of 1.25%. So there is a, the interbank exchange rate that the State Bank of Pakistan offers. Okay, per dollar, we will buy rupees will be bought and sold at this rate. And then there's a market exchange rate. So if the market exchange rate goes up, 
State Bank of Pakistan also has to push its rate up every five days. And markets can be very unstable. You can understand that the dollar market goes up and down, foreign exchange market goes up and down all the time. Now, uh, the, your uh, chief of army staff has just had a meeting at the Karachi Chamber of Commerce. Right after the meeting, the, dollar, the rupee dipped up, the dollar dipped down just from that meeting. Should we take that as a permanent trend? No, not at all. Because these are very small fluctuations that occur all the time. Every day they occur. But if every five days the State Bank of Pakistan is adjusting for those, those ups and downs, this, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because now when the State Bank of Pakistan adjusts the rupee for that new speculative price of the dollar, since the State Bank of Pakistan is now offering the dollar for that much, that is going to become the base for all the foreign exchange uh, traders. So in this way, in fact, what the IMF has introduced is a kind of, not a st not, not, it hasn't stabilized the rupee, but in fact causes its instability, as opposed to another method which would be to, to do that exercise, but to do it every month or every three months, which would mean that the market exchange rate could deviate by a lot more from the interbank exchange rate, but the interbank exchange rate would act as an anchor to bring the market back down. That's no longer the case in Pakistan. So next, we also look at the circular flow model. It's not very complicated. It's very simple. On the one side, you have households. And on the other side, you have firms. And households, of course, buy uh, and consume things. And they own and sell factors of production. So for instance, households will go to the market, to the labor market, and the market for factors of production, which, as you know, will be land, labor, uh, capital entrepreneurship, and so on. And they will sell things, labor, land, capital, they will sell that to, uh, to firms that buy those things. They will buy labor, they will buy other things, and then they will produce. And they, by production, they will make goods and services, which in turn are sent to the market. Uh, and from the market, households once again purchase those goods and services. So in this way, resources move in this direction, whereas money moves in the opposite direction. Every time I sell something here, I get income. With that income, I spend it on the market to buy things. The market sends revenue to the firms. The firms in turn, pay, in turn pays wages, rent, and profit. Now, this looks all very neat and clean. And it looks like, oh my God, there should be no problem. It's circular, it's flowing, you know, we're grooving, we're jiving, etc. But it's not necessarily the case. Any interruption in any one of these things can cause a cascading effect across the whole thing. And economists like to believe that markets are very, very stable, there's this wonderful flow, and any rigidity in the market is caused by non-market factors. If you just got rid of all the horrible things that interfere with the market, things would flow really, really smoothly. But is that necessarily the case? Not at all. As, as you will read, expectations, speculation, credit, uh, mortgages, etc., etc., many, many things can throw this cycle off by a huge amount and cause a cascading effect that can lead to recessions, depressions, and even booms and busts. It can go any which way. So just because in diagrammatic form it looks very neat and clean, doesn't mean that it's as neat and clean as it looks. Much of this works on credit and uh, you know deferred payments and so on. Have you heard of the circular debt problem? In the summer, Pakistanis have a very high demand because it's very hot. And because it's hot, hot, we use air conditioners. And air conditioners push up how much electricity we use during the summer. So we're at peak you know, consumption during the summers. And in winters, we don't use electricity as much. In fact, uh, a lot of people have gas, uh, you know, gas uh, heaters and other heaters, etc. Even if you have electric heaters, you're not using as much electricity as you're using when you're using air conditioners the whole day. So during the winter, the... Uh, the, the, the demand for electricity goes completely you know, through the floor. And when that happens, the government still has to pay the IPPs a certain amount of money in capacity payments. But the government doesn't receive that money from the public, yet it has to make those payments. And that causes a cyclical circular debt that cascades through the economy, causing blackouts and uh, load shedding and so on. Okay, So that's an, yet another example of how this, uh, the diagram is very clear, but when you actually get into the nitty gritty of how these things are managed, uh, in fact, this can, there can be many, many breaks in this circular flow. Next, we have the quantity theory of money. It's not complicated, it's very simple. First, we have what's called the money supply. That's, the, that's basically um, you know, the notes, et cetera, that you have in the economy, plus something else, which we'll talk about just a bit. Then you have the velocity of money. 
which is how quickly money changes hands. And then you have the price level, which is how you measure inflation. And last but not least, you have all transactions of goods and services that are bought and sold. Okay. So the idea is that the velocity of money stays relatively stable. It doesn't change a whole lot. Um, so if production goes up and the number of transactions go up, so, and the supply of money stays stable, what will happen is that the price level will drop. But if the number of transactions decreases, money supply stays the same, then the price level will go up. All right, let's keep this side of the equation, or let's keep this constant. We can also see what would happen if we increase the money supply without increasing this, keeping this constant, it would definitely cause P to increase. If we decrease the money supply, P would also fall. So we begin to see that since this is more or less constant, the variation in the money supply can cause a change in the level of prices. It can cause changes in inflation. Right now, we're experiencing a lot of inflation, but it's not necessarily because of the money supply. Although the money supply is being used in a certain way or certain monetary policies are being recommended in order to stop inflation. Can you tell me what are the monetary policies that have been recommended by the IMF and the State Bank of Pakistan has put into place to curb the money supply? Exactly right. And what is the current interest rate that the State Bank of Pakistan is offering? 21, 22% almost, correct. And this go, could go up all the way to 25%. That's incredibly high. The, what would be the interest rate, the, uh, the uh, you know, interest rate of the State Bank of Germany be? Somewhere below 3%. Absolutely. It never goes above 3%. And ours is, above tw is at 22%, ridiculously high. Uh, it varies between 1 and 3% in first world countries. So, what is the money supply then? The money supply is not just the number of notes that a country publishes, but in fact, because we have what's called fractional reserve banking, banks create 90% of the money supply. Banks create money. It's not the government that creates the money supply. It's basically private banks that create the money supply. How does that work? A bank may give out loans far in excess of their deposits. Say they have a, a, a deposit of $100,000, okay? From that, they keep $10,000. Why do they keep $10,000? Because on a daily basis, people will come, they will need to make transactions, etc. So they need some, li some liquid money, that's called liquidity. They get these $10,000 deposits, they keep 10,000 rupees, and they make loans worth 90,000 rupees. People who get those loans put those $90,000 also in banks. Now they have, not, and at first they had $100,000. Now the people who took out loans put the $90,000 in banks. So now they have $100,000 plus $90,000 in deposits. Now from this amount, $90,000, they can keep 10% of that and make out further loans, which will be $81,000 kill loans. Now those people get $81,000 kill loans. They go and put them in banks again. They, now their deposits are $100,000, you pehle mile the. Then $90,000, jo loans ki shakal, jo in loan ko loans di unhone deposits kiye. And then another 81,000, that is 271,000 in terms of their overall deposits. And from this 81,000, now they can make some further loans out. And so this continues and continues and continues until you run out, um, you know, completely. So that is the potential that banks have to create money. They only have to keep a certain fraction of their money, of their deposits as liquid money in, in the form of liquidity. And the rest they can make out in loans. And when they make those loans out, those loans also come back to banks and they can make loans on the basis of the lo those loans. And then they go get those back and then they can make loans on the basis of those loans. And they get those back and they can make loans on the basis of those, and it goes on and on. And in fact now, the latest point of view on, in this regard is that even though in fractional reserve banking you can have 10, you have to have 10% liquidity. Now because you don't actually need notes to do any transaction, you can do it with credit cards. You need 0% liquidity. So potentially, you could have 100,000 rupees and you could make limitless loans on the basis of 100,000 rupees if, you, if your fractional reserve is zero. That's called a fractional reserve. A fractional reserve is the amount of money required by the State Bank of Pakistan that commercial banks have to, they have to give to the State Bank of Pakistan as a reserve uh, in order to operate under the license. So if I make a lot of loans out, that's called the Phillips curve now. How does that impact your... Uh, currency, the value of your currency. Well, if the money supply expands because of bank credit, as I showed you, because of fractional reserve banking, if it expands rapidly, what can happen is that there'll be a lot of money in the economy. And we just studied 
पहले जस्ट लिल वाइल गो दैट इज द मनी सप्लाई इंक्रीज वेरी रैपिडली द वेलोसिटी ऑफ मनी रिमेन्स द सेम द प्राइस लेवल विल ऑल्सो गो अप इट वेरीज डायरेक्टली विद द मनी सप्लाई सो वॉट इज गोइंग हैपन हेयर इज दैट इज अ लॉट ऑफ मनी इन द इकोनॉमी and so people are giving lots of jobs their sort of unemployment is kind of going down there's a lot of investment going on so unemployment goes down but inflation goes up alternatively if they are uh, if the banks are not giving a lot of loans then the money supply comes back down so inflation comes down but unemployment starts so this gi- this gives a situation which we call the phillips curve which was discovered in the 1950s by w phillips who said that there is a inverse relationship between wage inflation as an unemployment so when inflation is high unemployment is low when unemployment is high inflation is low there's a lot more money and the same amount of stuff so the same more money is chasing the same amount of stuff so when there's more money is chasing the same amount of commodities this has to go up and it does go up well this is production what you're producing this is your price level which is inflation theek hai this is your money supply which i have told you is determined by two things first is the money that is printed second is the money supply which is created by banks velocity of money is the number of times that that money changes hands but that velocity is more or less constant because uh, the number of transactions you make generally every month is going to stay relatively constant in the sense ke i am going to get my salary at the end of the month with that salary i'm going to buy food clothing shelter you know petrol diesel whatever so consumption patterns velocity of the consumption patterns don't necessarily change very much so just imagine for argument sake that this is relatively stable if this goes up this side also has to go up now if this side goes up if this remains constant this has to go up if both go up then it'll be the same if this goes down this goes you know so basically it's just a simple equation when the money supply goes up just imagine unless the goods and services produced in the economy also see a 10% rise there's going to be inflation yes 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 if they want to but they can and how do they constrict the money supply no no you are almost there raising the interest rate so if the interest rate goes up as the state bank has put the interest rate at 22% who in their right mind is going to take a loan from a bank at 25% interest that's crazy it's a crazy level of interest right so that's how the money supply is pulled and how do you do the opposite how do you increase the money supply you decrease the interest rate so governments can increase can get an economy moving by decreasing the interest rate that would basically means that people will make more loans there will be more investments or they can if there's too much inflation they can pull back the economy by increasing the interest rate which will mean that uh, there won't be as much investment in the economy the economy will stop moving so quickly so this we economists like to refer to this as overheated economy overheating the economy or stimulating the economy through the interest rate so this is one tool in the macro economy available to the government through which they can manage inflation but having said that pakistan's inflation is entirely different it's not driven by the money supply at all what is it driven by what is it driven by pakistan ki jo andar inflation ho rahi hai aajkal kyun ho rahi hai oil prices and dollar prices that's called cost push inflation when oil prices have been going up after the ukrainian war and the dollar has been going up and so our oil bill has been going up and oil produces 50% of our power our electricity and so electricity is going up transportation is going up and if electricity goes up everything goes up including your school fee your lumps fee is going to go up because uh, yeah because the um, uh, mc is going to say ke look uh, you know price of electricity has gone up so we have to charge you guys okay so that's why in pakistan you're experiencing inflation it's not it doesn't have to do with the money supply but it has to do with cost push inflation okay but to control that inflation the government has and the state bank of pakistan has to push up the interest rate to 22% in order to restrict the money supply so that inflation doesn't get further out of hand it's already out of hand sensitive price index is at 25% which is incredibly high sensitive price index means 
stuff that we are very sensitive to, that are our needs, not our wants, food and stuff, okay? It's already at 25%, very, very high. So we're experiencing a major economic crisis and mainly it's driven by cost push inflation. If you know, if you know your A-level economics, inflation can have three causes. One is money supply, the other is cost push factors, and the third is expectations. Those are the three main reasons for inflation. Yes? This is called demand pull inflation, when there's too much money in the economy. Okay, next up is the production possibility frontier. And that basically means what can you produce? Now, this is a very simplistic graph. On this graph, we put computers on the one hand, we put cars on the other hand. So if you produce only computers, we can produce 3,000 computers. If you produce only cars, we can produce 1,000 cars. And if you produce some mix of the two, we can produce maybe 22,000 cars and 600 computers or 700 computers and 2,000 cars, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, in any given economy, you don't have two products. You have thousands of products. But you can't have a graph with thousands of sides. So this is a simplistic graph. And this is the production possibility frontier, which means this is the maximum your economy can produce. Of course, economies are always somewhere over here at point B. They don't expand. So basically, that's it. Uh, when you suddenly get a new technology, let's say your technology for computers improves. Now you can go from 3,000 computers to 4,000 computers. So this shifts out the production possibility frontier. Since you didn't get any new technology in cars produced, your graph over here remains the same, but it pushes out from that side. If you got new technology that also allowed cars to be produced, then your whole production possibility frontier would go out. This is a very, very, very simplistic way to understand, even a simple way to understand what's going on with the economy. Because as I told you, there are thousands of commodities that any society produces. We're only looking at two. So that's the simplification we're making. We can't put that on a graph. We can't put thousands of commodities on a graph where we have thousands of axes. You can't have that. Okay, so what is demand? The demand curve represents the actions of the buyers. What do buyers do? It is downward sloping because as price decreases, buyers can purchase more given their budget. This is called the budget effect, okay? So if something is very, very expensive, it's out of my reach. Like the iPhone 14 Max Pro. If you want to gift it to me, I won't object. But if I had to buy it, it's too expensive for me. So it's out of my budget. So I can't buy it. But if suddenly the price of the iMax 14 Pro, whatever the hell else it is, falls by half, then I can afford it. By the way, it's not fallen by half because dollar has gone up to like 305, 10 rupees, which means that the iMax Pro, whatever it's called, has got, become more expensive. So I can buy, I can't buy as much. And also there is diminishing margin utility, etc. Now, the important thing to understand is that the, this demand curve holds what we call tastes and preferences a, as a constant. What that means is, ke, as you said, utility function, my, you know, what I like or dislike has not changed. Okay, I, I'm not going, going to go for Redmi. Suddenly, I've not become all pro-China and said, I'm going to buy Chinese or something. Let's say our taste and preferences remain the same. The only thing that's impacting the quantity demanded that I'm buying is the price, nothing else. What if there are other things um, that are impacting how, what I want? For example, not the price. The price is the same, same but suddenly I saw Taylor Swift holding an I, that iPhone like this while singing a song and playing her guitar. And I said, oh my God, I got to have that phone because that's just so cool and I'm such a Taylor Swift fan. I'm not. Relax. But if that happened and I really began to like, you know, that particular phone, my tastes and preferences change. And they change very rapidly, by the way. Okay, what change? If I was a capitalist, how would I change tastes and preferences? What would I use, Tanya? If you were a capitalist and you were producing a bottle of water, how would you convince everybody to buy that bottle of water? Marketing and advertising. Yes, the simple answer. Sometimes you know you think I'm asking a complicated question. And how would you do the marketing? You get somebody that people admire to come and drink the water in you know some way that. Uh, people were just like, oh my God, that water looks so good and the person drinking it looks even better. I got to go and get that water. In other words, I would make it into a status symbol. I would try to convince you that you're going to be cool. Um, if you just use this deodorant, all the girls are going to be running after you. That's an, ad that's an actual advertisement, by the way. When tastes and preferences changed, it shifts the entire demand curve, out or in. But please remember, for every individual commodity, let's say this is novels purchased, if I shift this out, your budget has not changed. There are going to be other commodities that are going to shift in. 
because I can't just buy more of everything. I can't buy more of books and not buy less of something else because I have a certain budget. So just remember that the shifts are occurring in individual demand curves, but aggregate demand might not change at all. So to sum up then, um, price in the me when there is just a change in price and nothing else, that represents a movement along the demand curve. And when there are other changes, like I have more money, other commodities become cheaper or more expensive, my taste, expectations, number of buyers changes, then all of those things are shifted in the demand curve. Just two major things, price is on one side and all other things on the other side. Next up, in much the same way, we have the supply curve, and this represents the actions of the sellers. So as the price goes up, more people are ready to sell. For example, if the price is very low, I'm going to say the commodity that I bring to the market, I'm going to say, why should I sell this? It's too low. I'm going to keep it for a time when the price is actually high. I'm not going to sell it for this cheap price. You know, if I say to you, what phone do you have in, in the red shirt? Oh my God, iPhone 13. If I say to you, I'll give you 100 rupees for it, you're not going to sell it, right? But if I say I'm going to give you 100,000 rupees for it, Oh, sorry, you're still not going to sell it. <laughs> 300,000 rupees. Maybe. 500,000 rupees. 100, uh, you know, uh, 1 million rupees. Dollars. There. Now he's ready to sell. So you see quite clearly that as the price goes up, the willingness to sell increases. And that's why the demand curve is upward sloping. But again, as before, this movement is purely related to two things. Quantity supplied and price. If we look at other things, then we see that that causes a shift in the supply curve itself. So price is here, movement along the supply curve, and input prices, costs, etc., technology, expectations, number of sellers. As they change, the supply curve itself begins to shift. Anything else can shift the supply curve aside from price, which we hold to be constant, right? Now we plot demand and supply, and we get a nice little equilibrium. It looks so pretty. And we can do a little bit of fancy math here. And that makes economists really happy when they can put a, plug in an equation and do some math. Really, it makes it sound like everything is great. Equilibrium is the point where you have a given price that allows the quantity supplied and quantity demanded to be equal to each other. So the market clears. And economists are very happy that the market is cleared, regardless of what the market is, whether that market is of cigarettes or drugs or uh, you know, bombs or whatever it is. Doesn't matter to them whether that thing is a good thing or a bad thing. They like the market is clearing with happening. If the sub, if the price is too low, there's too much demand. Quantity demanded is too high. Quantity demanded is too uh, supplied. Sorry, is too low. So there's lots of people who are saying, "I want this iPhone Max, whatever," and there aren't enough iPhone Maxes available because the price is too low. If the price is too high, the opposite things happen. With opposite thing happens, which is that people want to sell. They're like, please buy this, uh, please, please buy this. And you're like, no, 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 I'll think about it. Kind of like what happens at Chalmi Market, right? Or when you go to Liberty and they're like, madam, 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 please buy this, right? Too many sellers and not enough buyers and the price is too high. So what happens when there's too many sellers, the sellers begin to compete with each other. They say, madam, I will give, I will give you the And then madam says, okay, I'll think about it. How much will And then he'll start dropping the price, right? So the price, whenever the price is above the equilibrium point, there's pressure on the price to come down and vice versa below. Now that sounds all, once again, it sounds so good. It's almost like a computer system, just managing things so neatly. But that's not the way it works, people. I have to tell you, in real life, this is moving all the bloody time. It's not steady. It's not static. It's a dynamic sort of situation. Because, oh, because prices are going up, below, the demand is moving up and down, supply is moving. Nobody knows where the hell the damn thing is anyway. There's no way to know it. The only way to know it, as I told you earlier, is when people actually buy it, which is by that time it's anyway too late. So there's no way to predict it. There's no way to know what the equilibrium price is um, in any satisfactory way, actually. And that's why, in fact, markets appear. There's a... There's a kind of a, a visual error that's going on over here. Because if you just look at the graph, it appears like this is a really stable system. But that is a visual error. No economist is actually necessarily saying that. But that's the impression that the graph is inadvertently creating in our minds. That's a very stable sort of system. So uh, what happens with a disequilibrium, again, is the price is too high or too low, the price will begin to move. 
And prices do move, and they move all the time. And they move even more because of credit and because of stock markets and speculation and uh, bond markets and other markets make them move. Okay, too many graphs here, I know, but don't sweat it. They're not that complicated. What is elasticity? Aapne kaha tha, elasticity. Uh, elasticity, as you know, is elastic is something that stretches, correct? It, it's highly responsive to any pressure. If you put a little bit of pressure on it, it goes all the way. So that's the same with respect to demand curves. That demand curve over there, or supply curves for that matter, that demand curve in the far, far corner, you can see is an absolute straight line, which means price upar niche, whatever happens, you're always going to be at, the quantity demand is always going to be 100. That's inelastic demand. What are some inelastic things? Um, food, basic staple, roti, very inelastic. Oil, by the way, can be very inelastic. Medicine can be very inelastic. In some cultures, if it's, a, if it's not a staple, but staple foods will be relatively inelastic. People will have to buy roti. What's another thing which is very inelastic and right now people are protesting about it? Bijli. Bijli, apne, if you are sitting here, you need the electricity. There's just no way around it. So that tends to be an inelastic. And over here, you have something that's completely elastic. If there's a small change in the price, it's going to go to in, the quantity demanded is going to be infinity. Of course, there's no such thing. Okay? There's no such thing. But you can imagine things just keep price thodi si kam ho, so you start buying a lot more of that thing. Mainly that's kind of like luxury goods. Okay? And also you have a situation where it depends on where you are on the supply curve. Please press that button again. So if you're high on the supply curve, you have an elasticity higher than one. And if you're low, sorry, on the demand curve, and if you're low on this curve, the elasticity is less than one. And this over here is called unit elasticity. So at the higher end of the demand curve, you are in the what's called the elastic range of the demand curve. And the lower end of the demand curve, you're on the inelastic range. And this, of course, has what we call the price effect and the quantity effect. We have the supply curve, and then we can plot what we call consumer and producer surplus. So consumer surplus is the area above the price curve and below the demand curve over here. And it measures basically the willingness of a consumer to pay for something, I am ready to pay 100 rupees for this bottle, but I only have to pay 30 rupees. That means I get a surplus of uh, 70 rupees because I could have paid 100 rupees for this bottle, but I only got it for 30. So that means in my mind, I saved 70 rupees. That's my surplus. Producer surplus is the exact opposite. It means I am ready to sell this thing for a lot less. I, I'm ready to sell it for 10 rupees. Instead, I got 50 rupees for it. So my uh, a producer surplus is 40 rupees. So consumer and producer surplus ko grab add karde, to you get social surplus. And economists love this kind of stuff because they feel that at the equilibrium point, social surplus is maximized. That's why they want everything to go at the equilibrium point. Now, this is also very deceptive because it only represents the, the choices of the sellers and the buyers and whether and their willingness to part or to buy that commodity for a given price. It doesn't represent what that commodity does to society in general. Are we talking about education? Are we talking about healthcare? Are we talking about drugs? Are we talking about what I call economic bads? What are we talking about? There's n we're not judging that. So the whole thing is not really even driven here by utility, but by ability to pay. Because demand, as you know, is not about just about utility. I could have a utility for something, I could want it, but I can't buy it because I don't have the money. So when you guys said demand is driven by utility, but not quite. Because I could have utility for something and I can't pay for it, then there's no, going to be no effective demand. There is no demand. Yeah. Uh, so you understood consumer and producer surplus and total so surplus, etc. Next, you get the concept of economic profit and opportunity cost. Now, economic profit and accounting profit are two very different things. I'm running a company and my accountant tells me, sir, you made 50% profit. But my economist tells me, sir, you only made 20% profit. What is the difference between the two? The difference between the two is that the economist is telling me that itna profit to tha. If you had done, if you had not done this thing and you had done something else, in the market, you would have, if you had invested your commodity or your money into something, into an alternative investment, you would have earned 20% profit because that's just the general average rate of profit. So for me to earn what's called an economic profit means that I have to earn above the economic rate of profit. That is the average profit. 
if on average people are only earning 20% profit, I only make an economic profit if I earn 25% profit. That means 5% is my economic profit. 20% or 25% is my accounting profit. That's what accountants look at when you, when you do the books and you say, this is my total cost, this is my total revenue, I earn this much profit. That's accounting profit. But economists are not interested in that. Why? Because they consider these things to be implicit costs. What is an implicit cost? It means that had you taken that money and invested it into the next alternative, the average alternative in the market, you would have anyway earned 20% profit. So you're not earning above average profit. Then we got production functions and cost curves. And the production function basically curves downwards. Why does it curve downward? Because, mainly because in a given level of technology, the more you begin to use it, the less output you get. So that's why it begins to curve downwards. And your total cost curve for the very same reason begins to curve upwards because as you produce more and more with a given technology, with a given machine, it becomes more and more expensive because of depreciation. So cost curves tend to go upwards. If we plot average, and marginal cost, what we get is that where marginal cost is just the cost that, it, that the last unit that you produced gives you, and average cost is the average of the cost, wherever marginal is below the average, the average is going to fall. And wherever marginal is above the average, the average is going to rise. So in that way, you get a relationship of MC and AC, which is just the math. It's got nothing to do with production, it's just the way the math works, aside from the fact that you've assumed that as you produce more, it's going to cost you more. And as you, uh, you know, uh, produce more, you get less and less output per unit of input that you give. So in this way, we see that the average cost curve is declining as long as the marginal cost curve is below the average cost curve. And then as soon as the marginal cost curve goes above the average cost curve, the average cost curve become, begins to go up. So you see that the marginal cost curve always cuts the average cost curve at the lowest point of the average cost. Now you can also take your cost curves and you can break them into two different kinds of cost. One is called fixed cost, the other is called variable cost. Variable cost is the, first let's start with fixed cost. Fixed cost is what you pay, what a capitalist has to pay, what an investor has to pay in or even if they don't produce. It's kind of like the capacity payments of the IPPs. So it's the land, it's the capital, it's the factory, etc. Even if I produce zero, I still have to pay for that. But it doesn't change once output varies. As my output goes up, I have to hire more laborers, I have to hire, get more raw materials, etc. Those are your variable costs. So variable costs are the ones that increase as your output increases. Whereas fixed costs just stay the same regardless of output, given one technological base. You can also jump technological bases and then that changes the whole thing. Okay? So, now what we can see is we can even plot what we call um, long run and short run average costs. So in the short run you have an average cost curve, but what if you get new technology? If you get new technology, suddenly your whole average cost curve shifts downwards. And with new technology and with new scales of production, your whole average cost curve comes down. So your, the idea is that in the long run your average cost curve comes down. Theoretically it can also go back up, but that's never really happened. They just like to plot it this way as a theoretical possibility. But as countries develop, the scale of production expands, the cost curves come down. The short run average cost curve is a point along the long run average cost curve. The long run average cost curve is downward sloping as you increase the scale of your production and get economies of scale. Now, let's imagine a perfect capitalist market. What do we mean by a perfect market? There are many buyers and many sellers in the market. There's no monopoly. The goods are offered by various sellers are largely the same. There's no differentiation of goods. Firms can freely enter or exit the market and there is perfect information. These are the four conditions of what we call perfect competition. The ideal conditions of the market. If you have these ideal conditions, what we soon discover is that let's say that an individual firm is what we call a price taker, which means that the market has set the price from demand and supply and the firm has to deal with that particular price. The price is also the average revenue as well as the marginal revenue curve of the company that the individual company is facing. So where are we going to produce if we are profit maximizers? We are always going to produce at the point where MC intersects with MR because we know marginal costs and marginal, be marginal benefits and marginal costs where they cut each other, that's the maximizing point, that's the optimizing point. So when the, where do the two cut? This is the MC, this is the 
MR, marginal benefit, marginal cost. Again, cutting over here. Since they're cutting over here, this is the quantity we're going to produce. That's the price that we've already established. Now, with this quantity that we're producing, our average total cost is this much. And now you can see that the price is here, the cost is here. So this whole area becomes what we call super normal, yeah, above average profit. Normal by the means means, by the way, means average. The word normal means just average. So if you say you're very normal, it means you're saying you're very average. If you're saying you're abnormal, you're saying you're above average or you're below average. Um, so that's perfect competition. Now, if you have a given price here, what happens with perfect competition? Over here, you can see that if the price is too low, you're going to have an economic loss. This could also be an accounting loss, but not necessarily. All it means is that you're earning below average profits. And there you have a super normal profit, and here you have a loss, an economic loss. Again, profit maximizing is always where MC is equal to MR, and uh, the rest you can see. Now, if you have perfect, if you have a perfectly competitive market, if, and if you're making an economic loss, the assumption is that firms are going to leave that branch of production. They will exit the market. The supply curve will shift. The supply curve will come down. The price, uh, if the price is too high and you're making a huge profit, the price will come down as more people enter into that production. If the price is too low, people are saying, I'm making a loss, I'm out of here. I'm exiting. The price will begin to come back up. So in that sense, the long run supply function that the firm faces is actually at the lowest point of the MC and um, average cost curve, which is called the, a point of allocative efficiency. It's the point because average cost is the lowest it can be. That means that that's the point at which you're producing the product at the cheapest point that you can produce it given a state of technology. And that's the main advantage of the uh, perfect, of perfect competition. Here you can see it operating. Here's the market demand and supply curve, and there is the individual firm. If the individual firm suddenly sees a situation where the demand curve shifts out, there's greater demand because of preferences, and the price goes up, and when the price goes up, the result is that the firm is making a lot of money, it's making a super normal profit. Well, people will want to make more of that commodity, so they'll enter the market. The supply curve also will shift out. And once the supply curve shifts out, the price will go up, but it will come right back down to where it was originally at this point where average cost is the lowest. So that's the good point. That's the sweet spot that we want to be in. That's the point where Ramiz Raja, when he swings the bat, it just goes to the boundary because it produces at the lowest point. So you see, in fact, that in a perfectly competitive situation, although we always, although Tristan said in the beginning, demand and supply determines or maybe somebody else said it, I don't remember, demand and supply determines price. But you now you notice that demand can shift it, but supply shifts back to bring the price right back to this point. And somebody else in the question also said, sir, cost of production is more important. And you see that actually the peg on which the price fluctuates is the cost of production. The anchor on which the price fluctuates, around which the price fluctuates is the cost of production, but this is an economic cost of production not an accounting cost. Okay, so what we then, how we conclude that is that we say that the long run supply curve, the short run supply curve is upward sloping like that. But in fact, the long run supply curve is flat at the point where AC is equal to MC, which is the sweet spot. Why? Because anytime there's a shift in the demand, the short run supply curve will compensate it and bring the price right back to that particular point. That, that is why we say the long run supply curve is actually flat. So you always imagine it's this, it's crossing, but no, actually it's fluctuating around that point. So an increase in demand because of tastes and preferences, let's say, will only cause a temporary upswing in the price and then it'll come back down. And a decrease will do the opposite. It'll fluctuate around a point like an elastic band. Every time it goes above a certain point, it's going to get pulled back to that point. It might get pulled back and miss it. And like an elastic, go up and down. That's what it does. But that's the mean point around which it fluctuates. The other structure is the opposite end, which is a monopoly. And in monopoly, you have a situation where there is a single buyer or a single seller, a monopoly or a monopsony. And in that case also, you have profit maximization. But here, the demand curve is the average revenue curve. This is the marginal revenue curve. 
we'll forget about how these are derived, but that just trust me that, that it, it's, it, it's, it's correct. And the MC is equal to MR is going to the point where we produce. And now you notice we're producing this point, the price is very high, and the point at which we're producing is different from the point where, it, where the average cost was min, you know, minimum, et cetera, et cetera. So we say that in a monopoly, we have what's called deadweight loss. We have lost social surplus. In, in perfect competition, we would have produced here, but in monopoly, we're producing up there. So every time you have a monopoly, prices are up, 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 above, quantities are lower, and that's why economists generally don't like monopolies, they like competition. So to sum up, to sum up, in the short run, prices are determined by demand and supply. You are absolutely right, but you didn't say it short run. One point for me. In the long run, however, prices are determined by the cost of production. You probably said that, but you didn't say that in the short run. So one point for me again. Please notice that all the points are for me. Capital always chases profit, but it doesn't chase accounting profit. It changes economic profit, above average or below average. So hence moves from loss making to profit making enterprises. Always that's going to be the case. If you're making an economic loss, it's going to move to those things that are making a profit. By the way, now you may imagine how can capital do that if my, if my money is invested in something? How does capital move from this place to this place? It can do so also by stocks, bonds, shares, credit. All of these things allow capital to move between companies much faster than if capital was fixed into machines and other things. Capital is just value that's being used to invest. It can move fast because of stocks and uh, the stock market can make it move in like a blink of an eye. So when we hear things like, oh yeah, Nike was doing really well, but it's lost $1 billion, uh, you know, over the, overnight. And you're like, how can that even happen? That's the stock moving from one company to another. When capital moves to a profitable branch, supply increases. And this brings the price and profits back down. That doesn't mean that they come to rest on the equilibrium. Again, this is an unstable equilibrium. It's an unstable equilibrium. It's not a stable equilibrium, but it, there will be pressure on it to come back down. Citrus paribus, there will be pressure on it to come down. All other things being constant. Speculation, expectations can make it move away from the equilibrium to a very high degree before it comes back. When capital moves out of a loss-making branch, supply decreases in that branch, and this brings the price and profits back up. This movement of capital from loss-making to profit-making industries is the price is the actual price mechanism. How long run? How we determine? As I said in the beginning, how do you determine that a roti is going to exchange for how many laptops? How is that mechanism happening? This is how it's happening in a market structure. Production, therefore is at the heart of the price mechanism. Although we often think utility functions, tastes and preferences, etc. Yes, they cause changes, but at the heart of the process is the process of production. This is the book from which I took the graphs, etc. It is a wonderful book. I will send it to you on WhatsApp. It will make for great weekend reading. It's the most popular book on the market. Now, why did I do this? It, as I told you, it's not because I'm a sadist. The reason I did this is because this is economics at the very heart of it. Everything else is the icing on the top of this. This is the basic idea that you have to know if you know about it. This is modern economics. Now what I'm going to try and show you in the course of this course is how these, number one, how these ideas developed. What is the prehistory of these ideas? How they came about? But on the other hand, I'm also going to try and show you how these ideas can be challenged or rethought, or what are the debates around these ideas? So in this 400 level course, we're actually going to kind of do, we're actually going to question the 100 level economics thing, or the basis of economics that we study. This is an anti-economics course. I only taught this class to tell you everything that I'm going to now disprove. Well, not entirely, not entirely. Some of it I'm going to show is deeply flawed. Some of it is self-contradictory. Some of it is absolutely true. Some of it is surreptitiously true. Some of it leaves some stuff out, which is very, very vital, and so on and so forth. But we're going to problematize much of this mechanism of economics. I'm going to approach economics in a very different way. Thank you so much for your time and patience.